Hi, my name is Dan Lynch. I'm with the Pennsylvania Game Commission and I'm a wildlife education specialist. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about trapping. Uh, usually when I talk about trapping I try to hit four points to start with and first I talk a little bit about the fact that uh, the animals that we trap in Pennsylvania are not endangered at all. Uh, they're, there's abundant populations of all of them that we trap otherwise we wouldn't be allowed to trap them. Um, I'm going to also talk a little bit about the specific animals but uh, so first the animals that, that we trap are abundant. Second, trapping is highly regulated in Pennsylvania. We have game wardens um, and game wardens have to enforce laws and regulations related to trapping. Um, we're Pennsylvania is probably one of the most highly regulated states. You must take a hunter trapper education course and you must follow lots and lots of rules that are in regards to trapping. The third point about trapping is that uh, trapping many times helps to protect people, uh, property and livestock uh, from certain predators that might come and you know and eat some of them. Uh, the fourth thing is that trapping for some species like raccoon, foxes, um, coyotes can help uh, control overpopulations of some of these animals that when they get to a, a certain level of population um, we have a problem with disease and sickness. So for those four reasons um, we um, have, have trapping in Pennsylvania. Otherwise, if, if we didn't, if we didn't have high, high regulations and things like that, um, the majority of people who are not anti, but just non-trappers would probably eliminate trapping. But be, as long as we follow those things, uh, we're gonna continue to have uh, people in Pennsylvania that are okay with regulated trapping. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the species that we trap in Pennsylvania. There are three different types of canines in Pennsylvania that we can trap. And we have these canines, uh, two of them in all 67 counties, and one of them in most of the counties, but maybe not the extreme southeast. So two, two of the ones that are super common in all 67 counties are the red fox. Um, there, this is a, a red fox in a winter coat. So um, in June, if you were to see a red fox, he might not be this bright red. Um, and the, the problem is is that he wouldn't have this lush coat because he's trying to regulate his body temperature by losing a lot of hair and having a, a summer coat. So one of the adaptations that reds have that most of the other canines don't have is they normally have some sort of a white tip on their tail. Uh, so this is a pretty common critter in all 67 counties. This guy is as well. This is the coyote or coyote. And coyotes come in a lot of different color phases. This is one that's kind of like a German Shepherd type color, but they come black brown, blonde, gray, um, and, we, and again, we have them everywhere in Pennsylvania. So this is a little bit larger critter. And then the third one is a gray fox. And the gray fox is similar in size to the red, uh, different coat coloration, uh, an animal that prefers more of a wooded habitat. So you're not gonna have too many grays down in the extreme southeast, Delaware County, Philadelphia County, those kinds of things. But as you move, start, start to move more northern in Pennsylvania, you're gonna have a lot more grays. So these are the three canines and they're very common for people to trap in Pennsylvania. All right, the next four species are all part of the weasel family here in Pennsylvania. We'll start with the smallest. This is the weasel, this is called the long-tailed weasel. Not super common, but he's not endangered or anything like that. It's just not a whole lot of people ever get to see them. Most of these species are pretty nocturnal. So unless you happen to be out at the right time of the day, you know, you're, or, or night, you're not really gonna be able to see these little guys. So you got the weasel. The next largest one is called the mink and also super common in Pennsylvania, found in all 67 counties. Um, the mink is one that spends a lot of time um, in and around wetlands. So if you see them around your pond or stream, uh, that's a common occurrence. The next one in size would be the fisher. And uh, the fisher has kind of a much longer hair compared to the other three. This guy is way more terrestrial. He's gonna spend a lot more time on the land, actually a lot of time in trees, because he's hunting for squirrels, but a common critter in, in most of the counties of Pennsylvania. And then this, the largest one in the weasel family is the otter. And you can see compared to the fisher, he's got a much more dense coat. He spends a lot of time in the water, so having long guard hairs on him would not be beneficial to a, an aquatic or semi-aquatic animal. So these are the four weasels we have in Pennsylvania. So this guy is the largest rodent that we have in North America and in Pennsylvania. This is the beaver. 
and uh, compared to the uh, pelts that I had just previously shown, this one is actually skinned open. So you can see he's kind of slid up the middle and spread open like that. And that's just the way that the fisher or the, uh, the beaver hides are, are uh, prepared. Um, and again, this is a large rodent. Um, this is similar to a, related to a mouse in Pennsylvania, um, but obviously not something that you would want to have, you know, a 40 or 50 pound mouse running around your house. But uh, this guy can cause um, a lot of damage um, if he gets in and around people, cuts down a lot of trees, floods roads, floods yards, things like that. And many times trappers are called in to try to uh, remove some of the beavers uh, just to kind of slow down their activity. So this is the North American beaver. So these three critters are pretty uh, similar in size and uh, they're very common in all 67 counties of Pennsylvania. This first one is the raccoon. Um, and you could tell he's a raccoon simply by the, the rings on his tail and a little black mask right here. Um, this one's not exceptionally large, but they can get pretty big in Pennsylvania. They can get to 30 some pounds, which is pretty huge for a raccoon. Uh, the next guy here um, in Pennsylvania, we call these guys Pennsylvania speed bumps um, because this is unfortunately how you normally see them, completely flattened out on the road. Um, but uh, he's actually an opossum. Um, he's actually the only critter that you can start with an O or a P and still be correct. He's an opossum or he's a possum. Um, he's our only marsupial, which means the female, she has a pouch. Um, and this is also uh, an animal that we trap in Pennsylvania. And the third guy here is one that you really should make sure that you can identify. This is a skunk. Um, all three of these critters are, are uh, North American fur bears and animals that you can trap in Pennsylvania. All right, the last fur bear that I'm gonna talk about today is a bobcat. Um, this is our only feline that we have in Pennsylvania. You can kind of see that he's a feline here. He's got some whiskers and short little ears. Um, this is a, a small representation of the bobcat. They can get to be 35, 40 pounds in Pennsylvania. They're gonna eat, uh, they're carnivores. They're gonna eat things like mice, uh, maybe even up to a deer when you get a much larger bobcat. Uh, but they're going to spend time eating, you know, smaller rodents um, and groundhogs and rabbits and squirrels and things like that. But this is also a species that people trap in Pennsylvania. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the types of traps that we use in Pennsylvania. This particular type of trap is called a foothold trap. And this is a live restraining device. So what that means is once the animal gets caught in here, the animal is still alive. Uh, and the trapper has to decide if he's going to, he or she is going to release it or they're going to dispatch it and, and keep it for the fur. Um, but this only catches the animal by the paw. Um, and it's, it's this particular one size wise is designed for an animal like a fox or a coyote or a bobcat. Um, in Pennsylvania, uh, trappers have to take a hunter safety course and when you take the hunter safety course, you learn about the different types of traps and you have to get, you know, license and you have to buy a trapping license before you can go. And in that course, we teach people about uh, using the right size trap for the animal that they're going after. So this particular trap is just a little big for an animal like a raccoon or a possum or a mink or something like that. But it's the perfect size for a bobcat, a fox or a coyote. And it's designed to catch the animal when they step on this pan. So what is kind of interesting about, about traps compared to hunting, and I, I do both of them, but what's kind of interesting about trapping versus hunting is, if I was going hunting for deer today, um, and I saw a deer two or 300 yards away, and I had a rifle with a scope on it, and I was proficient at that distance, I could probably harvest that animal from 300 yards, the animal wouldn't even know I was there. But if I was gonna trap a fox, and I was gonna use a small trap like this, I'd have to get that fox to be able to put his foot on top of this little pan, which is maybe inch and a half by two inches wide. Um, it's a little more difficult sometimes to, to be able to do that. So you have to learn a little bit about the animals, about their habits, about uh, where they like to live, characteristics and things like that. Um, and then this trap is, is actually hidden underground and I'm gonna show that in a little bit. I'm gonna do a little demonstration. So you don't put food or anything on here. You put food or, or you put this in a trail someplace else near the trap and then when the animal goes and sniffs or walks through they step on the pan and they're caught it does not 
crush or break the animal's foot. Um, I don't do demonstrations by putting my hands in them um, because this is the trap that I use for trapping and it's strong and it'll hurt. I caught all of my fingers and thumbs in, in traps already and I still have them all. Um, but I also learned how to do it to not get caught. Um, so it's, it's designed to hold an animal, let's say as big as a 40 pound coyote. So um, this particular one is called a coil spring trap. And what's interesting about it, it's got two coils underneath there. Uh, some of them are designed with four coils, two on each side. Um, so this one's a, a two coil trap. And um, basically what happens is you press down on these levers on the sides and the, and the jaws open up. It's a little stuck, this one's a little bit stuck. I'm gonna have to demonstrate that with my, when I get down here in a little bit, but basically these are the jaws, this is the pan, these are the levers. The part underneath here is called the base plate. And this part here is the trigger for the dog. And I will demonstrate that in a little bit how that works. Um, also, once you catch the critter, you gotta be able to hold them so they don't just run off. So this one has a chain attached to it with a couple of swivels. <clears throat> it also has my identification tag on it. Um, and then this is a chain um, attached to a little piece of metal that is dr uh, hammered down into the ground. And, and this way, once it's in the ground, um, the animal, when he gets caught, can only go so far. Maybe he can only go this far. And then when I get there in the morning, um, if it's an animal that I want to let go, I can put a snare pole around its head, I can, so it, it doesn't bite me, and I can step down on the levers and I can let the animal go, or I can dispatch the animal, um, whatever I'm planning on doing that time. So again, this one is called a coil spring trap, um, and I'll demonstrate its use in, an, in another segment of the video. So this is called a long spring trap. And simply, the, the last one showed two little coiled springs down here. This one has a long spring, nothing high tech, long spring. Sometimes they're double long springs with one on each side. Uh, this is a kind of a small trap uh, used for an animal like maybe a mink or a muskrat, something with very, very small feet. Um, and this one also is a, a, a foothold trap. We don't call them leg hold traps. They don't catch the animal by the leg, they catch the animal by the foot. And um, so this one also has a chain off the side and it's got a little swivel on here that you would attach to wire to something so that the animal couldn't get away. But basically they step on the pan, it's got a dog and it's got two jaws. Um, and that is the long spring trap. So this is a different type of trap. This is a killing type trap. Um, we call it a body gripping trap. Uh, some people have called it a cona bear, but a cona bear is a brand name. So this one turns out is not a cona bear, but it is a body gripping trap. It's on the smaller side. Um, so this is uh, kind of similar to a mouse trap. So a mouse trap, you put cheese on a little pan, the, the bark, the kill bark is, is sprung over and held with a little trigger. And when the mouse grabs hold of the cheese, uh, the trigger comes off and the kill bark comes around and it's, he's done in, in about a, a second or two. Same thing here, but this one is designed to be, to be set underwater in front of a hole where a muskrat or a mink might be going inside of it. So basically, demonstrate kind of how to set this thing. You squeeze the spring uh, with your fingers. And <clears throat> trap is set. So it's got these two little bars down here are the, tr are the, uh, the trigger. And this is called the dog at the top. And it's got a chain attached to it that you would, that you would wire to something. A, you um, can simply take a piece of wire and wire it to a stake or, or a limb because when the animal goes through it, um, he will be dead within a few seconds. So he's not gonna run off, try to run off with it. Um, and then basically what happens is when the animal comes through there, it hits that trigger and it gets snapped on him just like a large mousetrap. Now this is a small size. This is for an animal like a mink or a muskrat and they progressively get bigger. So this is four and a half inches by four and a half inches. Then they come five inches by five, six by six, uh, eight by eight, and 10 by 10, which is the largest. And the 10 by 10 are used for a much larger animal like a beaver. And again, they're, they're set in the water by regulation. They have to be set in the water so that they eliminate, you know, dogs and cats running around and going through a, a trail or something and get caught in something like this because they wouldn't be able to get out. So these are specifically have to be set in the water, kind of right in front of the hole or in a channel where really only a mink or a muskrat is gonna swim through. And this, so this is the body grip or the kill type trap.
All right, so uh, what I'm gonna do now, and now that we've talked a little bit about the types of animals and why people trap, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about just one type of trap um, and one type of set. And what I mean by a set is, there's two words for the word set. One is I'm gonna set a trap, and two, I'm gonna place the trap in the ground, and once I do, it is called a set. And my goal, um, if I was actually out trapping, would be to place this trap and try to catch, let's say, a fox or a coyote. That's what, that's what I'm gonna demonstrate here today. I'm gonna demonstrate what's called a dirt hole set. And the premise be behind a dirt hole set is simply that I'm gonna dig a little hole, I'm gonna put some food or something that smells good in it down that hole, and then I am going to place my trap in front of it, and I'm gonna cover it up with dirt and try to make it look natural in hopes that a fox or a coyote who be, who's coming in this area smells the good stuff coming out of that hole, comes over to investigate, and when he puts his foot down in here to put his nose down in the hole, he's gonna put his foot, his weight forward, and he's gonna get caught in that trap. That's the premise be behind this. There's a million ways to make this dirt hole set. I'm just gonna show you one way that I do it. First, we're gonna make sure that we have the, the proper size trap for the animal that we're going for. Uh, and again, this one um, is a trap that uh, when it opens up, the jaws are about four and a half inches wide. Um, and this particular trap is called an MB450. It's just the manufacturer's name, MB, Minnesota brand, 450. And it's one that I use uh, a lot for that species of critter. So uh, before um, I, I put it in the ground, I wanna make sure that it, it sets very well. And uh, so I'm gonna show you how I set it. I use, can use my feet or I can use my hands. In this case, I'm gonna use my hands. It might be even easier if I took these gloves off kind of show you. So the trap is now set. I press down on the levers, but the pan is sitting up in, in the air like this. What I want is I want the pan to sit all the way down level with the jaws or slightly below them. Now a cool thing that comes with this particular trap is on the dog, which is the trigger right here, they weld a, they, they put a little bead of metal on there. That's called a night latch. And a long time ago, uh, when trappers didn't have all these modern conveniences like headlamps and all that kind of good stuff, if they were trapping in the dark, they couldn't tell if the pan was set. Um, and so what they did is they used a file and they notched a little notch in that dog and then they could hear an audible click. Well, this company makes this little bead on there now. So I can put up the loose jaw and if something happens, my fingers are not in there. So you won't hear me jumping around and freaking out on camera. But if you hear, if you listen, you might hear a click. There is the click, tiny little click. And if you look really closely now, you'll see that the pan is slightly lower than the jaw. Um, and that's perfect, that's where I want it to be set. This way when the animal, fox or coyote steps on it, it doesn't have far to go before the trap snaps. But when the jaw was up in the air like this, it would take forever. And besides that would be hard to hide under the dirt, a pan sticking up like this. But you push it down until it clicks and now it's set where you want it to be. So, um, <clears throat> I need, um, once I start digging this hole to put the trap in, I'm gonna have to put this trap in the ground. And I'm gonna use this device, um, which is called a cable stake. And this cable stake is actually a, it's, it's actually on chain instead of cable, so a chain stake, but it's, it's um, called a disposable stake. Um, and the idea is you pound it down in the ground um, with a device, which is this driving tool. We put this um, in here and we drive it down into the ground, maybe eight or 10 inches, and then we pull this buck back out of the ground, and we pull it out of the ground and we pull on the chain, it goes from this direction to a T, and it helps to hold this trap and be very difficult to get it out of the ground unless you have it, unless you dig down in there or you have a device to get it out. So that's what I use a lot. Some people just use some sort of stake and stake it into the ground or they cross stake it into the ground. Um, but uh, I like to use these chain stakes or cable stakes. I just think it's, a, it's not as much weight to carry around and, and they hold really well. So I try to use what, what I think works. So some other tools that you're gonna need when you're trapping is you're gonna need some kind of a sifter and you can make that. You can just have a, a wooden frame or a metal frame and put some wire underneath here and I'll show you in a second what that's for. And then I use this tool, um, they call it a groundhog tool or a three-in-one tool. So instead of carrying three different tools, I carry one. This one I can use as a hammer. I can use this claw to dig uh, a hole out. And then I can use this 
and push down in the ground and pull it out and pull out a chunk of mud or dirt to literally make a, a hole to put my lure in. So instead of carrying three tools, I just carry one tool. Um, and then I'm gonna show you what I use this coffee filter for. Uh, there's lots of different things that you can use um, for what we call pan cover. Um, and, the, uh, and I'll explain to you a little bit when it's time to set that, what I use that for. So first thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna put some gloves on here. I don't always trap with gloves, but um, for the video here, I'm gonna try not to get dirt all over myself. So we're gonna use these gloves. So I'm gonna make this set right here. I'm gonna use this groundhog tool and I'm gonna dig out a hole that's about the size of my trap. Not much bigger than that. I only need it to go below the ground a few inches and I need it to be about the size of the trap, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take all this dirt and I'm gonna put it in a sifter. I like to have a bunch of loose dirt inside there. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna snap this so it doesn't accidentally snap on me while I'm doing this. So as long as your finger's underneath the loose jaw, nothing bad can happen. <clears throat> and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this uh, disposable stake inside the driver. And I'm gonna go in the middle of my hole and using the hammer part, I'm gonna hammer this down in here. Now for demonstrations, I'm gonna stop right there so I can pull it back out. If I was trapping, I would probably pound that in another eight or 10 inches. Then when it's down in there, I'm gonna pull the driver back out and I would give this a real hard tug and it would turn it from going down like this to like an L to hold it. So my, my trap is in there pretty good even though it's only in a few inches. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dig a hole and I'm gonna dig this hole at about a 45 degree angle, like this. And I'm gonna take all that loose dirt, put it right in the sifter. And I'm gonna probably go down in there maybe eight or 10 inches. And my hole, I'm hoping that the animal comes this way. My hole is at an angle like this so if you're a fox and you want to look down in this hole, you have to come over here to look down in the hole. If I dug the hole straight up and down, you could come in from any angle and look down the hole and you might avoid getting caught in the trap. But if I put it at this angle and you want to see down in that hole, you got to come over here to do it. All right. So I got my hole dug or my food or some sort of scent is going to go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this trap again. When people are first starting out, I just I have I teach them how to set with their feet instead of their hands, just in case something bad happens. You don't get snapped on. So now my trap is set, but the pan is sticking up in the air like that. So I flip the loose jaw over and push down till you hear the click. Flip the loose jaw over and it's ready to go. You just want to make sure you don't put your finger on top of that. That'll hurt. All right, so I'm gonna make a little bit of room in here for all this chain. I'm gonna place this trap down here in the ground. Now, what's more important than what kind of traps you have or what kind of lure you have is the part that I'm doing right now. This is the most important part of trapping and that is called bedding the trap because these animals, these foxes and coyotes and everything else, they walk around on their feet all day long and they know things underneath them aren't supposed to move. So if it moves when they step on something other than the pan, they are not going to just go, gee, what's that? What they're gonna do is they're gonna dig this trap up. They're gonna turn it upside down and they're probably gonna take a big old poop right on top of it just to let you know that they were there and you're not gonna catch them. And they're gonna come back tomorrow and they're gonna do the exact same thing to you. So if you bed the trap, if you put dirt all the way around really, really well, and they step over here, or they step over here, or over here, before they step on the pan, nothing happens, no problem. They're gonna keep focused on the scent coming out of this hole and hopefully get caught on that trap. But if this wiggles when they step on it, they're gonna forget all about what's in the hole. And they're gonna dig that trap up, flip it over. Sometimes it doesn't even snap. And like I said, they'll leave you a little calling card there before they're done. So 
what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take my coffee filter and I'm going to lay my coffee filter over top of that trap, just like that. And I'm going to take my sifter and I'm going to start sifting dirt over top of everything. You can see what it's starting to look like there. It's starting to get covered up. And then all the big chunks, they're not gonna go on top of that. All I want is the fine stuff. So when the jaws close, there's not a little rock or a pebble or a stick in there to get caught. I only want the animal's foot to be in there. Okay, so now I have a whole bunch of loose dirt. And I got a bunch of dirt that I'm not gonna use. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that loose dirt and I'm going to stick it right behind the hole as what we call blocking or backing. And I'm not done yet. So the, the dirt that I piled on top here, I sifted on top here, is a hump over top of the trap. I want it the opposite way. I want it to be the lowest part. So I'm not going to put my hands this way or like this. I'm going to put my hands like this. If it was to catch, it would catch this part of my hand, which is huge, and it wouldn't hurt. But you want to be careful. You can use a stick to do this, or I like to use my hands. And I just sift down until I make kind of like a little swale. And I want the lowest part of this whole set to be right over top of the pan. Foxes and coyotes like to step down on things. They don't like to step up on things. Now what I might do is take a little bit of grass and do what's called blending. I'm blending it in so it doesn't look so obvious that all of a sudden here's this fresh brown thing and looks different than everything else. You can also see I'm sitting on a kneeling pad, kneeling on this pad. I do that most of the time, not just because I want to keep my pants clean, but I keep the odors of whatever it is of my pants not on the ground right here. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take some lure. And uh, this is manufactured lure that you can buy. It smells really good. You can't smell this on camera, but trust me, it smells really good. Uh, and I take just a little bit of dab on a stick and I'm going to shove that down the hole. And if I'm really trapping, for real, not just doing a demonstration, I'm going to put three or four different scents down that hole. And if I have lots of people like to use fox or coyote or bobcat urine, everything's going down the hole. I'm not going to spread scent anywhere else because I don't want the animal to focus anywhere else except down the hole. So if everything that smells good comes out of that hole, that's what they focus on. So um, that's normally what I do. Uh, one of the things I think I did forget to mention was the chain, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, at another segment here. But um, I always tell people that if this is a good place in the area that you have to trap that you think you can catch a fox, you should always put two traps, maybe another one 10 or 15 feet away, far enough away that two animals get caught, they can't entangle with each other. But what if you're trying to catch a fox and the first animal that comes along is a possum. And the possum gets caught, then the fox comes running up here and there's no trap to get caught in. He circles the possum, thinking about eating them, circle them. But if there was another set 10, 15 feet away, you could catch him. Or if there's two foxes traveling together, why not catch them both at the same time? Um, so anytime there's a good place to put one trap, at least put two, if not three. Uh, so that's a real simple dirt hole set uh, used for foxes and coyotes. So the next type of trap that I'm going to talk about and set that I'm going to talk about is something that um, you would use for otter or beaver. Um, and because we're highly regulated, these types of traps can only be set in the water and they can only be set for those two species. And the trap that I'm talking about is this big guy right here um, called a body gripping trap. Um, so this is a kill type trap, which is why in Pennsylvania we set them in the water um, to specifically target you know, those two species and, and nothing else. Um, and uh, it has two springs. One of them is already compressed and one of them I'm going to show you how I compress it. Um, it's got a cable attached to it that we would attach to like some brush um, or branches nearby. We don't really have to worry about the animal taking off with it because again this is a killing type trap. The animal is going to swim through it and when they do they're going to hit this trigger um, which is uh, being held steady with this dog and when they do, boom, it's like a giant uh, mouse trap. Um, and uh, you want to be really, really careful while, when you're setting these types of things and make sure that you either have somebody else with you or you're, you're using safety devices, which is what I'm going to use. Uh, this is a safety catch. In case some reason these little, these little spring hooks 
fail, I've got one more device on here uh, because this is strong enough that this actually could break your arm. Uh, so you wanna be really, really careful. And when you think about it, when you're beaver trapping or otter trapping in Pennsylvania, uh, so otter's a short season in February, just a few days, but beaver goes from uh, usually right after Christmas in December till March 31st, so it's cold out. So you wanna be really careful that, you know, you don't get your arm stuck in this thing and it's already attached to a stake and you, and, and you can't get out and you're sitting there. So you just gotta use common sense and be careful when you're doing it. So I'm gonna show you how we set these things. The springs are super powerful, so I use a setting tool. Um, and basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put that setting tool in the little spring eyes and I'm gonna hold them together. And this way I can hold it together with one hand. This is a really nice setting tool. And I put the little springs on there and uh, let them go. And now the springs are compressed. I don't have to worry about trying to hold them. Um, what I am gonna do next is I'm gonna squeeze this together. So this is the part where you wanna quickly put this safety device on, uh, just in case something was to happen. Um, this will only let it open up about four inches before it would catch again. So we got three safety devices on now. I got one on each spring and I got one on the top. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip the dog over and it's got three different notch or two different notches on there. Um, and they are dependent on, um, if you put it in the end notch where I have it, it's the most sensitive. So um, if you put it on the, in the next one, the middle one, um, it takes a little bit more effort to snap the thing. So I like to put it on the most sensitive one. And uh, then what I'm gonna do is let's just pretend that I'm in the, in the water course here now in the stream. And this is an area where the beaver or the otter are swimming through. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this trap and I'm gonna set it on top and this would be in the water. Um, I'm gonna attach this cable to some sort of tree or bush so it can't go anywhere. I'm also gonna attach my identification tag to the end of this, and the identification tag has to be above the water so that a landowner or a game warden could check it without destroying the whole set. And then before I leave, I'm gonna take the safety catches off, and then it's ready to go. And uh, if a uh, beaver or an otter was to swim through, um, it's gonna catch them very, very quickly. And uh, it wouldn't make that kind of noise, obviously, because metal wouldn't be touching metal. Um, but that's basically, um, this one is called a 330, which is the size of the trap. Um, and it's designed for something big, like a beaver or an otter. And so you gotta be very, very careful um, and make sure that you're setting them in the water, uh, have safety devices, um, but that's how you set a 330. All right, so if somebody wants to get into hunting or trapping, uh, probably the best thing to do is be to check out the Game Commission's website. That's www.pgc.pa.gov. We're the agency that's responsible for all the birds and mammals in Pennsylvania, and we're also responsible for people that want to go hunting and trapping. Uh, we have uh, free hunter education courses. Uh, we also have online hunter education courses, especially at this kind of weird time where we don't have a whole lot of face-to-face -face meetings. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, uh, you can take Hunter Ed uh, when you turn 11. Um, you can actually hunt before that. We actually have a mentor license where you can hunt before you take Hunter Ed. Uh, you just need to be able to get a, a mentor license. So you need an adult to help you do that online. And you have to hunt with a mentor. That is somebody who's 21 or older um, who also has a hunting license. If you're interested in fishing or boat, registering a boat or something like that, there's a different agency. That's the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. So they're, they're responsible for all the amphibians, reptiles, and fish in Pennsylvania, and also responsible for all boating registrations and fishing licenses.